was here this morning for our intimate little event. Uh, so we'll begin the morning with a description of the design and fabrication process of Odin. Um, uh, first off today is uh, Ed Tabutzi. He has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering uh, and is a designer and researcher based in London at Adams Kara Taylor. He's currently the team leader for their computational unit, P-Art. Um, his degree in civil engineering is from Rome, Rome II? Uh, yeah, second, second university. And in 2005, and is, um, is interested in parametric design. Um, he's worked on a lot of different projects um, for AKT two, the BMW Pavilion, Coca-Cola Beatbox, um, Akihisa Hirata's Tangling Exhibition, as well as Bloomberg's London headquarters, which is presently uh, under construction. Right. So um, next up will be uh, Chase Jackson. Uh, Chase is a class of 2013, and he's worked with me since his uh, ju so junior year, sophomore, sophomore year, um, on a number of projects. Uh, he's currently working at Good Nature Brewery, the brewery representative. Um, after he graduated, along with his partners Hallie Kohler and Katie Scribner, he founded the Locovo Project, in which they renovated a school bus and made a cross-country journey um, recording and documenting uh, <laughs> local music and the importance of local music in the community. Um, he can fix anything. Uh, he's been a tinkerer since he was 10, by all, all, all accounts. Uh, and then I'll be, I'll be next. So, thank you. Ed? Great, thanks a lot, Louis, uh, for well, the opportunity actually to come here and, uh, and uh, show uh, what we've done. Um, it was a really great, great uh, privilege to work on this and to outline the process of uh, creation of Odin, which I'm going to try to actually explain to you today. Thanks all for coming. Um, as the wit mentioned, I'm um, uh, um, the team leader of PART, which is uh, a unit in AKT2. Uh, we are a consulting engineer in London, um, working uh, amongst with a lot of um, uh, the most important architects uh, of the likes of uh, AK, um, Zadid or Thomas Edwigs, uh, Norman Fosters, and uh, <coughs> the uh, the purpose of our unit has been uh, always to try to uh, be the connection between fabricators. Uh, architects, uh, structural engineering, and uh, and also try to link the academia uh, in the process. So we are three D designer, architects, computational designers, both so visualizers, engineers, uh, educators. Um, so we, we're trying to get the best of our, all, all all of these um, uh, domains and actually try to define a process that uh, is more organic. So. Talking about the process, um, we just uh, in the in the recent developments with the technological process uh, progress, we see that the computation time uh, has been dramatically um, improved in the past few years. Um, so, something that would have taken days to analyze in uh, back in the 80s, now it takes milliseconds. And uh, what what it is that this progress? Um, what's the implication of this uh, in the design of a, of a structure? Um, the the fact that actually we actually working with uh, a lot of different softwares also uh, it's uh, it's defining uh, a different attitude and different process. So conventionally we have uh, clients and architects and engineers and fabricator try to share knowledge and try to share um, data between themselves during the, the actual uh, generation of, uh, of uh, the process and most of the time those data are uh, disconnected so it's quite hard to, to find uh, a, a rational uh, link basically. So and if you look into an engineering practice also internally we have geometricians, technicians and engineers try to share data between ourselves in a very confused and uh, unsynchronized way. What we're trying to do in part instead is trying to define new tools to share this data between ourselves and eventually to also make the actual um, process of uh, 
creation of a, of, a, of a structure more fluid. So what kind of tools are we generating? We're generating geometric tools uh, linked to structural tools and to production tools, trying to um, link all the different properties uh, of the geometry and the structure analysis and also the tolerances that are coming in the fabrication all together to, um, to have a more informed design um, throughout the, the, the actual process. So I'm going to show you a few projects that have been uh, having the honor to um, perform and um, that mo all of them are actually have a form finding in common. So uh, from small installations like uh, the Louis Vuitton Pavilion uh, in Selfridges to medium-sized um, installation like the Coca-Cola Beatbox and uh, the BMW Pavilion to big developments like uh, the uh, Central Bank of Iraq Tower or the uh, Baku um, Museum with Adi. So in the, when you actually deal with form finding, you usually have an idea from uh, an artist or a, or a designer and um, the, the actual difficulty is actually to visualize it and to make it possible in terms of uh, design. So in this case, um, in this installation for the Architecture Foundation from Akisha Irata, we had uh, this idea of the architect who wanted to display his work uh, in this kind of um, almost organic form, um, but he didn't really um, had the tools to uh, to construct and to visualize his, uh, his idea. So what we did, we started from uh, the conception, so we had a 50 meter long strip to fit into a, um, a room and we developed the tools to, um, to actually uh, visualize and uh, simulate um, this kind of shape. So um, throughout um, parametric modeling and uh, you know, live physics modeling, we managed to um, come up with a, an optimal form for this shape and then um, send out the information to fabricator, uh, which in this case, the structure was made out of timber. It was a, a timber square skin, um, panelized to be actually transported easily in the, in the room and then assembled and rendered uh, for the final result. Um, another project being involved in this was the Merchant Square Bridge in London, Paddington. It's a dynamic bridge, so the idea is that uh, in this London Canal, you would have uh, a bridge that in, the, in this closed condition would be uh, wide to allow pa um, pedestrians to cross the river, but then uh, it would also allow it in its open configuration for the barges to, uh, to pass through the canal, basically. So in this case, using our tools, uh, connecting geometry and structure, we managed to um, parametrically design um, the, the bridge to define the, uh, the optimal position of the center of mass and therefore the, um, parametrically adjusting the position of the pivot of the piston and the, the weight of the counterweight in the back, um, defining then the optimal geometry and, and, uh, and the structural properties for the, for, the, for the bridge. We also then design all the uh, kits of parts. It's a, it's a, bo it's a box, um, uh, box girder, a steel fabricated plate. So we also um, had to uh, have a lot of thinking how to uh, bring it up together on site and, uh, and then uh, install it as well. So uh, here you can see the final result. Um, um, we did some exploration for this installation, which had some similarities with Odin, actually. This is uh, Richard Wilson trying to... Um, simulate uh, the crash of a NASCAR and to um, realize it in, in a 3D environment. So uh, the artist came in our office with a, a small little car, one of those that you can buy for your kids, and it just actually showed us his intention of uh, simulating the, the, the motion of the car. So we came up and studied uh, the best way to do it, uh, putting up a parametric definition to simulate the actual motion of the car. Um, so we had many iterations, uh, the artists actually worked together with us to uh, tweak the parameters um, to um, 
to get a pleasing form as well. The, the major problem we had in this case was uh, trying to get to a, an organic shape uh, which still would resemble the, uh, the crash motion but it would actually have artistically pleasing uh, lines and also structurally feasible connections and, and um, details, let's say. So, um, so we did all, all of that using our internal parametric tools. Uh, the, the good thing of this is that you know, knowing the, the structural feedback li in, li in a live way, you have um, the possibility of tweaking the geometry uh, to actually make uh, the structure work much better. Um, and we use the same concept in uh, the design of this tower in Iraq uh, with Zadi Architects. So the idea is here is we started to um, parametrically defining the geometry so um, trying to find the optimal, uh, in this case, the optimal panelization of the concrete face, trying to avoid curvature and working with the fabricator's tolerances um, to slightly tweak the initial geometries from the architect, but with um, increasingly benefits in terms of fabrication and cost. So we went through a lot of iteration trying to um, tweak those parameters. And uh, as a result, also the facade um, at the uh, quite a lot of the iteration in terms of uh, geometry, so we, we managed to to inform the facade consultants um, to get like a, a benefit in terms of uh, brackets, dimension, and uh, fabrication tolerances. Um, then looking into the structure of this complex uh, building, uh, we also had the chance of uh, dynamically extracting all the structural properties and uh, visually changing, tweaking the geometry to enhance the, the structural behavior. So this is the benefit of having a, a tool that actually combines geometry, structure, and fabrication. And also we've been quite um, efficient in extracting results and um, also visualizing it for, uh, for a better assessment in terms of engineering uh, properties. Um, so Let's see how this, uh, this process actually informed the, the genesis of Odin. Um, we were so excited when we first spoke with uh, the WIT about this project, and um, uh, it was quite hard to visualize it, so we asked him to send us some idea, and uh, that's, that's what we received the first time. <laughs> so, <laughs> as you can see, there was uh, this will of transforming uh, sort of uh, 2D or kind of uh, self-stacked um, initial ideas to a more a 3D um, geometry, more like a, going to a next dimension. So how do you get to go from a fairly straightforward um, structure to a more organic one? Well, the recipe is a, a great idea, obviously. Uh, 13 tons of steel, 240 circles, over 2,500 connections. An experienced fabricator and a great team to assemble, that's it, that's all you need, basically. Um, so basically, you can see it outside, I just want to talk about the challenges that we have. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the communication. I mean, obviously, there's a distance gap between us, and so in Colgate, there was the vision, uh, all the sketching, the physical modeling, the fabrication uh, experience as well. and. Back in London, we did the interpretation of the vision. Uh, um, we set up a set of tools to actually um, inform the process. And uh, we, uh, we did a little bit of work on digital fabrication, and then we focused on the structural design. And we did all of that through uh, voice over IP, which was quite, quite interesting, actually. Um, no data loss. Uh, it was quite an efficient way to, to go about. So, I'm going to focus on, uh, on five different uh, aspects today. So we had to build a customized tool uh, that would allow the wheat uh, to easily manipulate the generative surface, um, uh, that would allow him to play with the uh, density and the radii of the circles to actually have different configuration of the sculpture and then pick the, the best result. Uh, but in the background, we had to have a responsive structure of feedback to uh, quickly assess the different changes of these geometrical um, differences. And uh, so we did that by connecting the geometry to our uh, structure analysis software. And, and then we had to control um, 
efficiently the thicknesses of the circles. And then lastly, just pr produce the con construction set automatically from, uh, from the model. So if we look at the manipulation of the generative surface, we just build a very easy uh, parametric definition. For those who were here last night, we, um, as Greg mentioned in his uh, keynote, we use the similar software, well, the same software is called Grasshopper, and it's a uh, parametric um, visual um, coding uh, um, tool that is actually embedded in the Rhinoceros, which is a NURBS modeler. So it allows you to uh, quite easily manipulate uh, geometries. So it's got like containers where you store your physical or your digital um, surface in this case, and then other small components that performs actions onto the original surface to actually then, at the end of the uh, of the stream, getting out your final result. So in this case, we started with um, six generative 3D curves, uh, which would define a section of the of the surface, and then we um, we allowed um, the um, manipulation of those by control points and the result would be our um, final surface where to map the circle so you can see that quite easily there's a certain degree of control of, uh, of the, of the sur surface so then uh, we went and we tried to um, to pack some uh, circles around around the domain of the surface and initially uh, we had uh, we had a look at at uh, circle packing and or sphere packing, um, different kind of uh, ways of doing it. Um, but we then realized that uh, probably one of the best ways to go was to actually simulate um, the packing with uh, live physics behavior. So um, how did we do it? Well, we, we had to set up the model. So uh, first and foremost, we started with um, the setting out of the main fixed points. The idea was that the sculpture would al have allowed people to go in, so uh, there was the requirement of having a uh, wider um, radius circle around the surface um, to allow people uh, to enter in into the sculpture, so we defined a few um, fixed points where we actually stuck those ma main circles in. And then we identified randomly uh, the start node for each circle. <coughs> So we had a parameter in our tool that would have allowed to uh, define the number of the circles and then randomly placed an initial point. And then to perform the, the simulation, we then connected all the circles uh, with uh, lines, which we modeled as springs. Uh, and then we defined their rest length and the cutoff of the spring as a sum of the radiuses of the belonging circles. So basically we ended up doing all the possible permutations of connections between the points and assigning all these properties to, um, to the database. So that's what the, look, the tool looks like at the end. We have some sort of control at the beginning, so we have our initial surface, um, some indication of the radii and the distribution of the circles, and then we have a uh, engine here which actually uh, performs all the interconnection between the springs. Um, in here, we actually setting out the properties of the spring, so the rest length, the cutoff, and also some uh, um, pull force um, back to the surface to, to keep the points uh, navigating around the domain of the surface, but not um, not allowing them to uh, to step out of the domain of the surface. And then here is the engine of the physics simulation. So. So basically, these are particle-based uh, systems which uh, apply a certain uh, physics behavior and then iteratively trying to find an equilibrium. Uh, when the equilibrium is defined, we have our output, so we have the circles in here, which then we went on and we extruded um, and to form the actual uh, depth of the, of the circles, and then we then produced the, the final result. Um, this allowed us to play a lot with, um, with different geometries. So in this case, we, we played a little bit with uh, distribution of the radii. So we were playing with four different uh, sizes, and uh, we assigned different distribution to it, and we run the tool to see actually the difference, what difference could it make. And you could see that 
uh, in these areas where uh, well, you can't see it, but in these areas where we had those fixed points, um, the, this uh, circus wouldn't uh, change position. Um, I tried to put like a little video to show the, the process. So in here we're actually defining randomly the number of points and the, and the relationship between all of them. And then we run the simulation uh, and this actually tries to find the equilibrium with all the circles. Um, so it takes a little bit to run the animation, the, the simulation, but then it's quite quick to change parameters. So in here we can uh, move the fixed points of our uh, main radii and rerun the computation to see what difference would it make to the actual um, final shape. Or we, uh, we could play with the um, distribution of the radii. So in here we could uh, change the percentage of different uh, radiuses around and again rerun uh, the solution to, um, to find out what, what difference would it make. So, um, Obviously, uh, I made a lot of work in the visualization after, uh, after we actually did uh, the process. So the wheat had to work a little bit with a rougher version, I think. So I'm sure you're not recognizing this. But, um, but essentially, uh, the, the, the main core of, of the tool stayed the same, actually. So um, the wheat had to do all this iteration himself. And then it came back to us and uh, informed the process quite a lot, so we've, we've been receiving uh, many questions on tweaks that we could have done on the tool to make it work um, maybe faster, more efficient, or uh, influencing it by um, uh, properties that it wanted to explore of, uh, of the steel material and, and, and all of that. So, so then obviously uh, the geometry is one part of it, but we had to, um, to see if this thing could have stand up, so we linked it to our um, structural analysis tools. In this case, um, there's a couple of software we're using in, the, in our companies. One is Sub2000 and one is Sophistic, uh, which uh, they perform nonlinear non analysis. Uh, in this case, we used a finite element analysis. Um, and to build up the model, we use the same geometry, obviously, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the many iterations. So we first defined the number of connections around, so we parametrically uh, find out all the intersection point and, uh, and assign the property of connection to it. And then we also went on and meshed the whole, um, the whole surface to then be sent, ready to be sent into, into the structure analysis software. And then we have this live feedback kind of uh, for different load scenarios. Um, and by using this, uh, interconnection then we can investigate the, uh, the distribution of the stresses around, uh, around the plates um, for these uh, different load cases scenarios uh, and then maybe by uh, getting this live feedback inform back the geometry tweak the, the thicknesses of the, pla of the plates or whether that wouldn't work then re reconfigure maybe the, geom the geometric model introducing wider um, radii or smaller radii or more connection to it so we went on and doing we, we did all this kind of work in the background so um, by extracting all this information we, we would um, we have been able to actually investigate where the peak stresses were and how they will would uh, propagate and redistribute all over the, the structure and we found out that uh, um, one of the um, the um, ways of actually controlling uh, the structural behavior was to vary the circle thicknesses. So uh, we went on and modeled a um, parametric uh, study on kind of trying to vary uh, the different thicknesses around the circle. Um, we worked with 11 gauge and I think 14 gauge, I wrote 15, but that's, that's wrong. Um, and then we um, we ran a genetic algorithm back to actually inform what was the best thickness for the best uh, configuration of the circle. So we let it run overnight and uh, we then eventually find out uh, which one were, were the circles that would have uh, benefited by increasing the thickness of, of the plate. So in here you can see the red uh, circles are 11 gauge and uh, the, the blue ones are uh, 14 gauge. This was uh, one of the final results I think. 
and then iteratively we rerun um, the analysis and uh, evaluate um, the stresses again to, to see what difference would have made. Um, and uh, that was basically uh, how we dealt with, uh, with the actual uh, analysis. Um, the benefit of having this iterative process is that you can do it quite quickly and uh, making very important decisions in terms of uh, tweaking the geometry to enhance the, the, the properties of, of, uh, of the material. So um, eventually we locked the elongation of the steel to, um, to 20% and uh, by doing that we, we, we have seen that um, the structure would perform um, quite well under the load cases we defined and even though the deflection would have been quite large, um, uh, I think that one of the main reasons uh, uh, we, we define this kind of uh, properties is because the wheat wanted uh, the structure to be quite dynamic. So, um, so and actually you can see it, the result is quite yeah. dynamic in a way. Um, finally, um, we, uh, by using this um, set of information stored into one place, we've been able to, uh, to come up with a um, quite efficient way to uh, produce the um, construction drawings and, uh, and to share it with, uh, with, uh, with Chase to perform uh, the, the construction. So we, we unrolled uh, every single uh, coil uh, using a script again, and um, we shared this information back throughout with Rhino models, um, every single element would have had a tag assigned to it, uh, which would define its properties in terms of thickness and, uh, and uh, geometrical sizes. Um, so one of the benefits of having this whole process laid out is that then if you have to go and, uh, about and make uh, any small changes, um, that doesn't really affect the, um, the cost or or uh, the production of, of uh, this kind of um, structure because it's quite easy, easy to um, reproduce uh, the, the whole process throughout, from the beginning to the end without any extra effort. So um, yeah, then we had part of, part of the, the construction set was also some indication of uh, tolerances and um, properties of the connections. Um, and some of, uh, quite interesting, some, some of the conditions that we, we didn't model because of time constraint, but we just had um, to share with the width in terms of uh, 2D graphical form. Like in these cases, uh, if uh, the circle wouldn't have had uh, at least four point of connection, we would have to introduce uh, smaller circles to, to interconnect them. But, um, then there has been in the process some convergence. Uh, we had the chance to meet and uh, test a little bit our uh, physical, digital tools in a physical way. So uh, the week came to, to London to attend one of the smart geometry workshops. And, uh, and that was quite nice because um, we set up a similar, similar way of working and uh, we went from digital modeling to fabrication in just two days. This was the attempt of uh, uh, build like a dynamic structure that would uh, respond to different loading conditions. Um, so it was quite nice because uh, first we met and it was quite nice to, to meet face to face and we tested our uh, working way as well uh, in a physical way. So, um, so this was the result at the end. Uh, it was an amazing journey um, where we learned a lot and uh, but the, 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 the good thing is that it's not over yet I think we, there's a lot of work that, um, and a lot of things that we uh, discovered during the fabrication that would be quite interesting to um, feed back into the tool because um, I think the idea, the whole idea of, of uh, generating this kind of uh, installation was to create the tool rather than the, the actual, solution, the, the actual uh, solution at the end. So, so it would be quite interesting to import all the, uh, the information that came out from the fabrication back into the tool. and. Uh, and improve it uh, even more. So I'd like to uh, finish with a, with a question. Um, I was really struck by, by this, uh, this question from Cedric Price, which is uh, technology is the answer, but what is the question? Um, so yeah. 
I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Straight to Chase's presentation, and we'll have some hopefully have some time after mine for if you have any questions. So. I'll just exit this thing. Yeah, just on. escape. Morning. Um, how do I get it into the? All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, as DeWitt said, I've been working with him for about four years now since I was a sophomore. Um, and I just want to say thank you to DeWitt and everybody. For me, it's really been a great opportunity, especially as an undergrad, to work with um, such smart, intelligent people, um, particularly people who all seem to have grad degrees or in the engineering or design world professionally. So it's really been great for me um, and an awesome learning experience as well. Um, so a little bit about what I'm going to talk about is basically the translation of uh, that design process, which obviously for DeWitt and I is way above our heads, <laughs> um, and for a lot of us is, unless you're specifically an engineer, um, and translating what we were given um, into the physical. So DeWitt touched on that a little bit yesterday, um, of how you, there, you start sort of in this virtual world, um, whether it be in your head as a conceptual idea um, or and translate that into a virtual two-dimensional version on the computer um, and at some point that needs to be translated from what really is just software um, and coding into a real physical thing. Um, so obviously Ed did a ton of work um, and it took years of uh, DeWitt Skyping back and forth um, to get to what he just showed you um, which were these complex tools and models um, that produced something uh, that hopefully we'd be able to figure out how to build. Um, so what we were given, Dewitt and I just sort of looked at it for a, a little while trying to figure out exactly how we were going to do it, um, how we were going to produce these, uh, the production fabrication uh, pieces that Grasshopper sort of spit out to us, um, who was going to do it, and um, sort of all these different pieces. Um, so one of the benefits of having an engineering firm that does a lot of things in-house as um, Ed's firm does, is you sort of, if you need to tweak something for a fabricator, um, which in our case was a CNC laser um, cutting shop, uh, you can just do it very quickly. But for us, because they were across the, you know, over in London, we couldn't just tweak something super fast, send it right back to the fabricator, and then have them okay it and have it go. So a lot of it was a learning process for us. Um, little tiny things as stupid as we need to change the color of this for every single one of these things. Um, or this isn't quite the right file format, um, and there seems to be not a set standard that every fabricator uses. Um, so we ended up doing a lot of trial and error, finally landed on somewhat of an inefficient method to do a lot of these things. So I'm going to run you through that process a little bit, um, not completely in depth because it was very tedious, especially in the first couple months, um, but sort of what that process was um, and, and how DeWitt and I were able to translate these complex engineering models into something that we could then build and produce into what you see out there. So what I'm going to start with basically is I'm just going to pick one of the circles, one of the cylinders and run you through um, what I did. So I've picked a random one. Um, you can see that they're highlighted in yellow. That is THK2-23. I got very uh, intimate with a lot of these as I spent a lot of time just sort of staring at them individually. Um, there's another view of it, and there's it by itself. So uh, we were given both the 3D version and the uh, rolled out flat ones, um, but I just want to show you in the 3D version and we'll go to 2D. Uh, so a little bit about what the data is so you can make sense of it, it touched on it. Um, but so we are given basically where every text dot is right there. So we'll start with uh, THK1-4. Um, that is delineating what the connection point is and what cylinder it's connected to. Um, 
the colors just are showing which uh, thickness it is. So red is just the little bit thicker ones. Um, the line there is basically the intersection point. So if you were to put the two cylinders right next to each other, that's the tangent they connect on. Um, and at the end of that line in the middle there are two points. Um, the points are the center of the circle where the holes are going to go. Um, we, they sent it to us with points as opposed to actual circles put in there because we weren't sure as what bolt size we were going to be using. Um, and we also wanted to be able to scale it. Um, and when you're scaling something, so for example, Odin right now is actually at 90% of what it was sent to us at. Um, the model out there in plastic is at 10%. Um, and so we quickly realized that if we wanted to scale it, the holes couldn't be in there first because if you scale it back 10%, it's not necessarily a standard bolt size. So we had to sort of put whatever bolt size, um, change the holes to the bolt size that we were gonna use. So basically, as we went along, we found all of these um, little things that we would like to be able to tweak. Um, and now that you know we're actually meeting with Ed and everything, he's like, oh yeah, you know, we could put those in pretty easily. It's not that big of a deal. But it took to wait nine months to figure out exactly what we needed to tweak, how we wanted these things. Um, so we ended up sort of making our own bootleg versions <laughs> of uh, tools to do this. So rolled out flat, um, basically DeWitt and I sat down and tried to figure out what data we needed to um, actually translate onto the physical piece, what would be the most useful for us um, during the actual construction. So we sort of landed on a couple of different things that we definitely needed to get onto the piece. Um, one of the most important ones was the labels. Uh, we wanted them to be on there, but not visible enough that you would notice them, um, especially after it patinaed. Uh, so if you go out there now, it's you really got to look closely or put on your glasses to find them. Um, so we scribed them on, basically. So in the laser cutting process, they just power down the laser a bit, and it just scribes it right in there. So we had to take those from just those big bulky text dots and put them on as physical text um, and scale it to a, uh, a size that we'd be able to read, but it wouldn't be that visible. Also on the rolled flat version, you see all the ruling lines that go around. Um, so for the, for the rolling part of that, that was very important because we needed to know at what uh, angles we needed to roll the cylinders. As we weren't going to be looking exactly at the 3D model while we're sitting in a hand roller, it wasn't like we have a nice hydraulic computer controlled roller to do all these things. So there was still a fair amount of crap that we need to figure out how to sort of integrate into this very digital virtual model. Um, so we didn't want the lines to appear directly on the uh, pieces, you know, shooting all the way across. So we figured we would just sort of put little uh, tick marks basically along the sides that then during our construction process we would just mark with chalk so that we could see them easy, more easily um, and put those on there. Uh, obviously the holes also needed to be entered. So every single point, I mean, I think there's 2,500 connections, um, so that's the holes that go to um, other cylinders. Um, but total holes, there's over 5,000, um, and that is because once it's rolled out, in order to roll it back together, we needed to create an overlap zone, which was about six inches on the end. Um, and then there's three bolts that then keep it together into the actual cylinder. Um, so basically, after Dwight and I sort of identified these pieces that we needed to include, um, in the final parts, uh, do it just sort of set me free, and I don't know that much about Rhino, still don't, but I learned a little bit, um, and I sort of developed these processes to get there. Um, so those are the finished ones, that's what we had to get to, um, and as he showed you, there's a lot of them, <laughs> and once we got them all enrolled with all the labels, it got very overwhelming for Dwight and I just when we're first looking at it, um, but quickly once you get into it and a little bit more comfortable with it, it's, it's really not. So this is um, a little bit of a close-up of what the finished, uh, almost finished construction piece would look like. So the way the CNC uh, laser machines work is they uh, identify their instructions by color. So it seems like, I'm sure they can set it, but fabricators seem to be very stubborn and won't look at it unless it's in their specific uh, format that they want. Um, so. The guys in Buffalo that we used, uh, the white delineated where they were going to cut, yellow delineated the uh, inscriptions that they were going to be basically scribed into the metal. Um, so once we got that all figured out, 
realized we had to change every one of them to that. Um, and then we left all of the points. So basically this is arranged by layer. So uh, there's a cut layer and a scribe layer is how the fabricator wanted it. So the yellow is that. Um, and the points are also in white because they will eventually be holes and also need to be cut out. Um, so there's a little close up in the bottom right corner of each. We also labeled the piece so we could tell what it was in addition to all the connections of all of it. Um, and I took a few comp sci classes uh, when I was at Colgate and uh, and I've done some 3D modeling myself just in more simple programs that are purely the design part of things. Free ones such as SketchUp and other ones that you know undergrads sort of learn on. Um, but this was just the simple script that in part uh, we found online and in part that we sort of tweaked to what we needed to. Um, but this is basically a very simplistic version of a tool that would be integrated in, onto sort of Ed's production side of things. So basically this is just highlighting all of the points that are in the specific object, um, creating holes set to our uh, what radius we want them at, and then it's just replacing all of the points with circles. So very simple code, but for us, we were all excited. We could all of a sudden batch process all the holes, all the points that we had, because there's 5,000 of them, um, and that was great for us. So DeWitt and I, um, sort of by the end of this, it took us three or four months to sort of identify exactly what tools we wanted. Obviously, we need to be able to change the color very easily right across the board for all of them. Um, we wanted to be able to change what the hole size was very easily. In part, as I said, that would change based on scale. It also can change on material, whether we're using stainless steel bolts or galvanized or this or that. Sort of all of them are different, so that would be very useful. Um, and yeah, so by the end of it, um, that's after the script runs. Basically, it just pops a hole in there and it's ready to go out now. And uh, sort of the final piece that we ended up doing, um, which we didn't actually really need to do because they did it for us, was uh, nesting these things. Um, so when I say nesting, basically we had the pieces of steel that we were working with were 5 feet by 10 feet. That was the maximum that the uh, fabricator could cut into. Um, so not only did we have to, well, so we thought was to try and get them on each piece as efficiently as possible with as little waste as possible. Um, but a lot of our pieces were much longer than 10 feet once they were unrolled. I think the largest diameter out there is about 10 or 12 feet, um, and that unrolled is 40 feet. So obviously we need to split a lot of these into multiple pieces. Um, so once again, that's one of those uh, tools that would probably be fairly easily integrated into the uh, sort of back end of things. Um, but for us, that was sort of a realization that we had, um, and we more or less did manually. Um, and a lot of that, as I said, just because we aren't our own engineering firm and it's an extra cost to you know, get an engineer to drop what they're doing and build these custom little tweaks um, you know, for a, a project that's not of commercial scale. It's a, more of an experiment um, and done with grant money. So we, uh, yeah, we really, really worked hard to sort of identify these things. And uh, I have a whole other set of scripts that we ended up writing that um, tweaked things and made things much easier for us. Um, but now I'm talking to everybody. It hopefully will be integrated into the new system um, and we'll further build up our uh, sort of tool bag and what we're going to be able to do. And uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, thank you, Ed and Chase. So just to kind of put a timeline on this, the, those first surfaces that Ed was showing um, actually were done in the fall of 2012. Um, and then over you know, a period of time, uh, we, started, we started back up, um, sort of things went sort of fallow for a while. It's, you know, doing a collaboration is interesting because we're all doing other things, right? Uh, in Ed's case, they're a, a big engineering firm you know, with lots of uh, paying projects. Uh, you know, ours was a research project. Um, everybody, you know, uh, really was generous with their time. 
uh, you know, we, we, we gave the AKT2 a very modest sort of fee to cover costs, but clearly, as you see from the amount of work done, it was nowhere near, you know, the quote-unquote sort of billable hours. So we really appreciate, um, you know, the, the time that was given to this. Um, yeah, so the, and then the, <clears throat> the actual design drawings really were finished in the uh, fall of 2014, no, 20, yeah, 2014, and then the, no, sorry, 2013, and then the fabrication, Chase and I really started up again in the spring of, of 2014 and, uh, you know, worked pretty much straight through from then till the, about the middle of November when the piece was finally installed. And just sort of one more context, so as I mentioned last night, the, you know, once we got the steel that Shay showed you on the pallets, um, it was only eight weeks between that point and the finished installation, right? So the, so in this case, all the work was done ahead of time, right? So all that, those months of time of us sort of noodling around, trying to, you know, starting, figuring out we were in the wrong place, starting over, figuring out we were in the wrong place, starting over, um, you know, gets here. So just really quickly, I'm just showing, I'm showing an, old, an old piece. Uh, this is a, 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 for a private client um, just north of New York City. Um, and, and for me, when I made my older pieces, the, these, these were actually more closer to actually cylindrical shapes. Uh, the ones we're working on now are kind of these conic sections or frustums. I always had to stack them kind of on a line, right? Sort of in, in a, in the same way you would stack a firewood or a stone wall. Um, in this case, um, propped up between these two trees. And what this tool has allowed me to do is to, um, and this is sort of a section of the plastic model in the construction, is now to put these circles or frustums on any surface, right? So now there's an, an ability to, to make curvature, um, so um, objects that can stand on their own, um, and then introduces a whole new um, kind of tools that uh, there'd really be no other way to make this, right? That is, um, in some theoretical universe, you could probably build all this with little paper cones and hand find all the things, um, but it would take um, years. And I think this goes back to what uh, you know, Greg was saying last night, is that the, in some ways this is sort of re-in, reinserting craft processes, this old methods of hand building and things that were done in with, you know, ships and uh, you know, in the early industrial age uh, that we've lost, right? But these tools allow us to really craft things in a way that's um, you know, otherwise impossible or, uh, or very, very expensive, right? Uh, that would never get done. So I just want to go through the, the sort of physical process. Um, this is a nested set of shapes. This is for the, the polystyrene model that's out in the lobby. Um, and as you can see here, as Chase mentioned, you know, every fabricator wants things different, right? Their machines are set up to read things certain ways. So in this case, the black lines are the cut lines and the red are the scribe, right? So we uh, had to figure out ways to um, you know, easily transition between these two things. Before we had the scripts, we were actually going in like file by file, layer by layer, switching the colors. Um, and over time, we developed some better tools. Right? So this is the file that went out to the fabricators. They were located in Las Vegas. They're like an electronics fabrication company. They do circuit boards and things. And then we got these sheets. This is Emily Fritz, a, a high school student who was our intern um, over the project. And she, you can see here she's um, peeling off the paper uh, protection off of these uh, sheets. You can see the blanks there and then all of the pieces there that are, are ready to roll. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, I got some these little hand rollers, I don't have a picture of those, but the, it, I haven't had so much fun in years as building this model because it was, I had to sort of summon up all of my old tricks to try to get these things to work. So that's a panini maker I got at Perry's because this thick plastic wouldn't roll completely. And then I had to do tests, and this is so I've got uh, uh, parchment paper, and I put two layers of parchment paper, and you know, I had to figure out how long to leave it in the panini maker so it was soft enough to roll, but not so soft that it started to dissolve, right? And so that funny shape there you see, right, there is that's, the, that's its, what it looks like. And it's, you know, they're small, right? They're quite tiny. Um, in retrospect, we should have been using slightly thinner plastic, but, you know, we, when you spend all this money on the plastic and things, you, you work with what you have, and there's little tiny stainless steel screws that hold these together. And the other problem we had is that, um, as Chase was saying, is that these, these um, frustums have differential curvature, right? So on the ends, they're, they're quite wide, and on the sides, they're nearly vertical, right? 
and we don't have sophisticated rollers that can change both the orientation of the piece and also the pressure, right? Such things exist, um, so um, it, it is possible. So when we roll them, we get these kinds of, you know, sort of potato chip, you know, saddle shapes. Um, so we had to figure out a way to um, flatten these things into planes. So uh, Chase, I mean, not Chase, um, Cole Hodges' um, uh, family, they were moving their grandmother out of their house, so they had an extra oven, electric oven. And so I developed this thing, so I've got two cookie sheets, um, again, some parchment paper and some quarter-inch steel. Uh, I put them on the sheets, I put them in the oven, and I, after trial and error, about 18 minutes at 145 degrees, this is after going online and finding the melting point of styrene and et cetera, et cetera, right? But there it is, flattened out. Um, but there's, you know, 240 of these things, and you're baking two-thirds of them for you know, 20 minutes at a time. I spent a lot of time in my studio baking plastic, uh, trying to figure out other things to do while that was going on without forgetting it and ruining it. Because a few of them did get, you know, they were, they were in there too long. Right? So then you have lots of little pieces um, and you start trying to do your assembly, right? And here we are um, starting to do some assembly. And uh, it was very exciting when we were ready to build. Um, Actually, the reason I realized I had to flatten the, the flatten the things is we tried assembling it without flattening them, and it was just kind of, it wasn't closing, right? It was just going in this sort of big sheet. So I had to figure out a way to um, flatten them. But then when we first started building, some of it went together very easily, and then there were these pieces that were, just weren't going in, right? The holes lined up where they were supposed to be. Everything seemed to be right, but they, we were breaking them, and I was like, there's something wrong, right? Well, there's something wrong. And it turned out that, so if you have a, so if you have a, a cone, right, so you basically have one edge has a shorter circumference than the other. And if your holes go around here, and I'll just do it this way, let's say A, B, C, D, E, F, right, um, and they're located, you know, somewhere along here, um, if this cone is inverted, the holes still stay in the same location, right? And what we discovered is that the, for some reason that we could probably fix, um, now that we've encountered it, is some of, the, some of the cones unrolled in one direction and some unrolled in the other, so they were backwards, because um, there's a kind of handedness. And once we figured that out, um, we took them around and rolled them the opposite way, and then everything assembled. And what was really interesting in this whole project is that whenever we had trouble assembling something, um, it was our fault, right? So we were, something was wrong with what we were doing, that in fact the software and the design was perfect, right? And so it was very interesting, even as we were building the big one, whenever we would have trouble, there was some condition that was set up, you know, the, the whole overall volume had stretched or moved, and once we were able to sort of solve those problems, the piece all came right back together. So we assembled this model, it's sort of proof of concept. This was super exciting, you know, because you never know. I mean, there was, there, were, there was probably more than one point in this project where I'd, particularly sitting in front of the computer, I'd sort of push away from my desk and say, you know, this just might not work, right? You know, this is, I might have actually finally bit off more than I could chew, and I was never going to actually make this. Um, from getting estimates of cutting that were $66,000, to final estimates of cutting only 6,000. There was all these different moments where I seemed to have reached a kind of limit. Um, I spent six weeks working with a fabricator who really couldn't do the job, it turned out, the one who thought it was gonna cost $66,000. Um, so, uh, but you know, this was like the proof, right? And it, it, it did assemble beautifully, right? These holes all lined up. Um, and what's interesting about the plastic model is it's, it's much stiffer, stiffer to volume and weight than the, than the metal, so it actually assembled very easily. So as Chase said, this is what we got from the laser cutter, right? And of course, laser cutters, they, these guys, they cut everything out, they just stack them back on a pallet and they send it to you, right? So we spent a long time sorting parts, right? So at one point, the, this yard that we worked in is probably, I mean, close to half an acre, and we had every available piece covered, but that still allowed us to drive the forklift and our vehicles in and out. And as Chase said, hardly any of these pieces were actually 
able to roll as just a single unit. In fact, the, it's only something only three feet in diameter is about the maximum that you can get out of a single sheet. Right? So everything that's bigger than that was made out of multiple pieces. And sometimes it took a fair amount of um, persuasion, uh, particularly these small ones, uh, to get them together. Um, you know, four clamps, load straps, hammers. Um, uh, but in, in the end, it was actually, rolling them was not as difficult as I had imagined. Um, and they started to accumulate in the studio. Um, I started with all the small ones first, because uh, I thought they'd be the most difficult. Um, I wanted to get those out of the way. Um, and again, as Chase was saying, you know, we got better at, at, at putting these together as you went along. Um, all this is Greg Owens. All the edges, also, we used a, a wire brush, right, to ease the edges so there was no sharp, um, no sharp edges when the, if somebody came in contact with them. And here he's standing inside one and he's uh, checking to see if the burr has been removed. Uh, and then they, we started stacking them. And you, and you here see, you can see that kind of curvature I was talking about when you do the rolling. And so to, to combat this with the steel, what we did is we put in these cross braces, which uh, took that curvature out and sort of stretched the opening so that the, um, so the frustums would lie in a plane, which is one of the things um, I specified in the design. Um, there was a simpler design solution in which the faces of these frustums were actually curved, um, but I wanted them flat, sort of more in relation to my work. And I think actually, particularly in the finished way, the, the way the edges don't coincide is, is more, a little more interesting to me formally than it was uh, originally. And then we started um, trying to sort of pre-assemble some components actually, right, because we, we didn't want to get all these things up here and just discover it wasn't going to go together, right. And in doing this, we thought we had caught all of the ones that were rolled backwards, but no, right. We would, and the same thing, we'd be struggling in clamps and so on and, you know, it turned out every time we struggled, it was because one of them had been rolled in reverse, and you know we re-rolled it, and um, and problem solved. Um, and the <laughs> the frustum started to accumulate in the yard. Um, we're starting. We're adding more pieces there in the back. Uh, we drank a lot of coffee and ate a lot of donuts, and they're accumulating more. This this the. the inner pieces growing. Then I made 16 trips from my studio to the job site um, with the pieces stacked. It rained a lot. We worked in the rain and the snow. We didn't have any time to wait. We got a very, very big crane. We made a really big mess of the yard. And we started flying the pieces in. Um, the crane uh, had a 170-foot boom on it, right? So it was complicated because the crane had to be uh, below uh, one store, one floor below where we were craning in. We had to, um, after much consternation, um, they, they, they agreed that we could fly right over the corner of one of the buildings, right? They didn't want us to go over any buildings that were occupied at all. Um, but in the end, everybody was able to sort of you know, uh, calm their anxieties. And we started to assemble, right? Um, so here we're putting together, re reassembling the center section. Um, in order to be as efficient as possible, we tried to, uh, on the ground, we were pre-assembling groups of five or six um, so that we could bring them up as units rather than single cylinders. And then what was, what was, what was also challenging is that I realized that we needed to in order for this thing to go together, it, it's in, in it's this form, it's, it's very flexible. As you can see, it, it wanted to sort of, you know, open up, right? So we had to figure out a way to keep it supported during the construction. And one of the very useful things about the three-dimensional model is I could take a measurement from the ground plane to, let's say, like the top of um, that edge and get a very precise measurement, you know, 11 foot 6. And so we could, we could lift it up with the crane, put in the brace, and so on. And this was a process that, that continued all the way around. Um, Todd Julian Thompson, who is, is not here now, he's, he was the, the, he's an architect and a builder, um, and he was responsible for designing this, uh, 
structural scaffolding, which had to do two things. It had to hold the piece in position, um, but it also had to provide us a work platform for closing the top, right? So we, we, you know, we tried to find, you know, we tried to find a, a place to shoot this level. And again, having the three-dimensional model in the computer, we could very precisely know where our openings were and where these, um, where these various cross members. It ended up being a, an eight-sided figure, uh, an octagon that, that encircled it, right? There's Chase uh, cleaning the snow off one morning. Here we are um, putting in one of these larger assembled units. We're starting to come over and start closing the top. We had a crew of about uh, up to 11 people there um, over a seven day period. Uh, the, two crane the crane operator and his spotter, um, and then you know, anywhere from six to, six to you know, eight of us um, working at a different levels. Some people assembling below, someone driving the, the, the rough terrain forklift, moving the pieces in position for the crane. Here we are, we're almost, I think we're getting ready to set uh, one of the last uh, couple pieces. Uh, you know, and again, what was remarkable is that throughout this process is that really um, we almost never had to drill new holes, right? Sometimes there were holes missing, right, you know, in this sort of process. Um, and only really in the last one was there, there was so much, it was, the stress was too great that we actually had to shift the hole slightly uh, in one direction uh, to complete the piece. Then we washed it, gave it a bath, uh, it was covered with mud, and uh, when the steel comes to you and um, from the mill, it's, it's, it has a coating on it that um, uh, prevents corrosion. You need to get all that off or as much as possible. It was, there were lots of marks on the pieces, chalk and so on, uh, during the building phase. We had to remove all of those wooden braces um, that we hadn't removed before. And then it snowed. Uh, this is a photo that Liz sent me. She went up there on the first day of when it snowed. Um, so the snow is, I, I would say there's sort of two things to say about the snow. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, it was really fun just a couple of weeks ago to see it without snow again, finally, because it's pretty much had snow on it since the 1st of December. Um, and it, it reveals some very interesting kinds of, uh, you know, there's, it creates this new sort of formal element. Um, but also it's a worry because there's, you know, the snow load, the weight of the snow um, does have an effect on the structure. And it does look like between, you know, the middle of November and now that the piece is settled maybe another six inches, not a lot, actually. I mean, you know, sort of an acceptable amount. Um, so it is still, it's pretty resilient. And I think that's, a lot of it's because is there aren't so many horizontal surfaces, you know, that hold the snow, that there's so many openings that really, uh, you didn't get a lot of uh, snow collecting, uh, particularly on the top, right? So the top really, the snow falls through. It's only on these outer edges where the snow accumulates. Um, so for me, uh, just, to, just to finish, um, you know, after this piece, everything is different, right? So I now have a set of tools and uh, tools not, not only to, to design and fabricate, but like tools of imagination, right? So there are structures and forms that I can consider um, that were really impossible to consider uh, before we went through this process. Uh, it wanted was of collaboration. Um, you know, it took a long time. A lot, a lot happens in three years. Um, a couple of us lost uh, parents. Um, one person retired. Uh, one of our principal investigators changed jobs twice. Um, people had come onto the project. People come off. In fact, Ed sort of came on in the middle of this three-year period um, to take a key role. Uh, you know, and it's it's a it's it's a it's a fascinating thing to to go through and and but to then to come to a place where really this 13-ton experiment which is out there in the courtyard, uh, as Ed said, which there's so much more we can learn from, right? And my work has always been a, a kind of process of asking a question like, what if? What if we do this? How's it gonna behave? What's gonna happen? You try it, you learn something. The next time you fold that information in and try something different. Um, and I'm expecting that this, uh, this process and, uh, and this collaborations and and people that I've met, um, I'm hoping that this process um, will lead to many more of those kinds of experiments. And just one last time, the credit slide. Right? All the people, again, big and small, who had a role in here. 
you know, just, you know, I've been buying this, my steel from this guy in Alabama, Central Steel Service, for 15 years. You know, he's now sort of a partner. Um, uh, all the people at, the, at Colgate who were really instrumental in um, making sure that this happened. Um, students who took, played small in roles. Um, Greg Owens and Jonathan Schaller, who I called and they came and worked on Saturday and Sunday, you know, on their, of their own free will. So uh, I just want to thank everybody and, um, and uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to what, what comes next. So are there, I mean, Chase had to run. He's actually, his other job, he's running a beer festival somewhere in the Poconos today. So, yes. Okay. And assuming the larger ones were quite heavy, how did you handle that weight while you were trying to pull? Yeah. Well, the, the the largest ones, as Chase said, the, the biggest one out there is about 11 feet in diameter. So that's almost almost 40 feet in circumference. But the the thing to remember is that it was broken into like five different sections, mm -hmm. and so each one of those sections I can um, move myself. I mean, they're heavy, but uh, but they're uh, but they were possible to sort of move um, once they're assembled um, Once they were there wasn't any shape that two of us couldn't with some you know some exertion pick up and move But then I do have a forklift and other equipment that I can use in my studio to move things around so the weight was from you know, maybe 30 or 40 pounds like something you could pick up this to I probably probably the heaviest elements 40 in there Five, you know, they were probably in the range of maybe five or six hundred pounds or, or less, right? So it's interesting when you're doing these kinds of composite, uh, composite structures in which, you know, you have a lot of small elements that, that adds up to a quite a large volume and light, large weight. But really considering the size of this piece at, and at, at 13 tons, it's actually very, very light, right? There's very little material out there. And some of the things that we discovered uh, in the final assembly is that, you know, we're, we were really pushing the material, you know, a little bit past its limits in places, right? That it's, it was sort of, you know, not quite up to some of the loads and some of the unpredictability. But, um, but that kind of semi-predictability has always been part of my work, um, in which ways that the shapes of the, my sculptures are really determined a lot by the gravity and the position of pieces um, and adjacencies. I like it with the snow on. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I have to say, in terms of just looking at it, the lines are visible in ways that they aren't elsewhere. Yeah. If that were indoors, it would be the same thing. No. I mean, they, they, you know this because of all the Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, whenever, you, and whenever you work outside, you know, you have to deal with the weather, whether you're building or not. And then it also, you know, you see things, things happen that you are really almost impossible to predict, right? So there's a kind of discovery you make working in outdoors and public space that, I think is one of the reasons I'm, I enjoy it, because uh, there are things that happen that, that are, you know, unexpected. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this might be a question for, for the engineer, but um, do I know that you talked about scaling this structure up to pavilion size or architectural size? What, how, what sorts of things would you need to do to make it, you know, more structurally uh, performant and for, for an architect? Mm -hmm. well, it's a really interesting question. I think uh, the ability of actually controlling the, uh, the behavior structure with the tool uh, will definitely give us um, ideas on how to counteract the, uh, the problems that we will encounter if we scale it up. Uh, but it really depends on, on the geometry uh, at the end. So, um, yeah, I think uh, to a certain extent, there's a, a little bit of flexibility in increasing the thicknesses of the of the actual prostums, uh, but past a certain uh, ratio, you would have probably to to prop it or or to devise um, maybe solid sections or uh, with actual uh, stiffeners in both ways or things like that. So it could actually lead to also different patterns, uh, openings and, and closures. Uh, so th that, that is definitely scalable. Uh, yeah. I think also, I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, in one of Ed's, that you notice the sm all those small ones that I was fabricating first, those are a whole set of pieces that I 
sort of euphemistically call were sort of built by hand, right? That they, they weren't part of the, the, the definitions and the algorithms that generated the patterns. And those had to be inserted to increase the stiffness, right? So there were places where there were four-sided openings or sometimes five-sided openings that we put those small ones in to stiffen. Um, and uh, I think what, you know, there was in some ways the, we relied a lot on that, the, this iterative tool to sort of place the circles. But in retrospect, I think there's, there's some sections that could sort of be rebuilt sort of by hand with different diameters and different thicknesses that I think even in the, in the, short, in the short term we could have much increased the, the stiffness of certain sections and the performance and, and had a, a result more in line with what the, with what the definition predicted, right? So that so the, the center section sort of is really crumpled. Um, and, you know, just watching it happen, I was like, oh, you know, I, we could have fixed that, right? You know, the openings were just too big. There was just too much, too, much too much unexpected load there. And that would be a place where you'd simply probably want to go in and sort of, you know, build a bunch of small ones and have them sort of taper, right? So I think that's a, there's an interesting tension between what the, the iterative tool that provides the kind of randomness or semi-predictability which you like but then, you know, but then there's this testing that needs to be done in the other direction. Huh? Well, Toho could come on this too. You don't really have a triangulation here because there are openings between the circles, which sometimes are four circles tangent, but not the circle in between there. And I, I guess the math would always say, if you really want it to be rigid, you should be doing triangles. Right. Yeah. And I'm curious why you didn't. Two triangles. I mean, does it happen that the triangulation starts to become so small? That I, I, I was just curious. Yeah, I'd say that there's certain places. There are there aren't so many. There's a handful yeah. of places where there's still a four-sided opening, but it typically is is the the two cylinders are so close together that trying to insert an element in there would be it would be difficult. It just difficult. Not 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 impossible to fabricate, but you know difficult because um, that we're down. So that my sort of minimum roll, my rollers are about about a foot, right? And we had some that were, you know, yeah. that you or just smaller. You can bend the steel. Then. Yeah, I mean they could be bent. Six inch right, they could be bent, or something could be fabricated that would would work in that way. But I think, from my perspective, what I've identified is sort of the weakness or the 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 ways in which it behaved in ways we weren't expecting is not not so much those little things. I think we the overall. Skin is pretty stiff. It's the, it's actually the arrangement of the circles, and then in some cases the thickness of the material that was led to you know this. So basically the sculpture went this way, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't just the it, it transferred a lot of the load to the center, right? So the sides, in theory, we thought the sides would be sort of stiff enough to keep that center section suspended, and it didn't perform that way. And also, no way. I'm sorry. I just wanted to comment because I think it's so interesting. When um, Dorda, I know you're, you were using Sophistic and SAP and, and yeah. these great tools, and then when we were just out there, you're like, well, we think it's this big piece that's holding it all up, and we think it's this small piece that's hacking. So I, I think it would be amazing to, in terms of going forward for creating this as a piece of architecture, um, to understand that language better, like actually understand the roles of the different sizes mm -hmm. and the orientations of the cone extrusions. And yeah. Like yeah. So. Yeah. And no, I, it is actually the benefit actually working with a, as well with a surface in this case that you actually can predict a lot more at the direction of principal stress lines and things like that. So. Um, it's just in this case was also a bit of a time constraint. There's a lot of intelligence that we could actually add to the tool right now, but that we didn't necessarily because of the of the time constraint. Of the well, time constraint, you know, and budget. You know that you could, if you had a lot more time and a lot more money, you could do a much more sophisticated, you know, structural modeling of this tool. But right? the, the the interesting thing is, I think is that by doing and by the, by putting the tool together, we had to um, to think a lot and. A lot of the thought that we've been putting into the process has been then generating other tools that we're actually using in other projects at the moment. So, um, so it's, it's, yeah, for example, the uh, the genetic algorithm that we applied for the for the circle thicknesses. Then uh, we're kind of reusing it like uh, in, in other um, in other problems. So yeah. it's, it's you said that you were it was your fault that you didn't. Uh, uh, 
uh, how do you say, fold it uh, in the in the right way? Did, mm -hmm. Are you given instruction what is what is out and what is in, or? Um, well, the, well, what it was is that the again, it's it, there's some there's a glitch in the in the unrolling part of the definition that probably has something to do in the, with surface direction. So yeah. in the surfaces have they're either oriented inward or outward, and then even the vectors that describe the circles, if you sort of click the right things, you can see what direction they go. And I suspect that somewhere, you know, you could probably tell the definition that you know the shortest circumference is always you know, do this, right? And, but it just, in the generic way, and I, and I think probably it's also, you know, some of them, they're oriented to different vector lines, right? So, and, and I think some of the ones that are, were moved and manipulated by hand probably ended up having an, an orientation that wasn't consistent, and they were put back in. And so, you know, it's just one of these things where you're sort of moving between different spaces, and, and the computer only understands its original orientation. So it, it just does it. Right, and so I, I figured it out by trial and error. Right, we'd try to put one in, it didn't fit, and we'd roll it back and it fit. Right, that's sort of, and even like even you know even when we were building it here, there were five that I had to take back to my studio, and you know unbolt, roll the opposite way and run them back up here. Um, you know, lucky it was all close by, and there was always plenty of other things to do. Uh, we didn't have to, it didn't no, slow sphere, things down. Sphere is orientable. This means that you can always orient all circles in the, the same direction. And yeah. if you would be printed out the, 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 uh, the sequence of uh, places where you have to put boards, mm -hmm. in the, always in the same direction, and you would always know that uh, it is the shortest one, uh, shortest side of the uh, mm -hmm. custom uh, that is uh, inside, then there wouldn't be any possibility of an error. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's also it's also the case that the that they're not all some of them. It's they're, the short circumference is actually facing out, and the long circumference is facing in because it curves twice. Then you then you right. 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 Yeah, right. But yeah. anyway, it's whether it's concave in or concave out. Where yeah. Those right. Go. Okay. right. Yeah. Yes. Did you know in advance of the beginning of this project? where you're going to put it, and, and, and were there other site considerations that you had? Um, the, uh, I have to say, so when we started the project, um, I had no idea that this is what we were going to build. Again, we were trying to sort of create these tools to sort of, you know, and it was sort of as Daniel's suggestion, he was here, because, oh, he says, there's this thing we can do. We can pack circles. And as I understand it, it comes from these paneling definitions, right? That, yeah. that underneath paneling definitions are these intersecting circles, right, these panelization tools. So it's kind of a part of another, you know, another definition. He says, oh, you know, look at this. This is what we could do. Um, and so there, was other, there are other things that we've been working on, some different kinds of pattern folding and uh, sort of these fabrics. And this is the one that just sort of became, in the, in the sort of time limit of the grant, the most plausible thing. Um, I've always liked this space out here. Um, it's never really, we've done some temporary art installations with students and some visiting artists. Um, I thought, you know, what, what's good about this is that it's controllable. I can, you know, I can control the axis because even though this thing weighs 13 tons, if it were out in the quad and 10 or 15 kids decided to get up on top and <laughs> jump up and down, they could permanently damage it, right? So there's sort of, it's an ideal thing. So as you can see it from inside, it has all this wonderful, you know, vision from the, the hallways. You can see it from above, um, but it's in a place that, um, you know, it's reasonably safe. So, um, and then all my work is, and so this was crafted specifically for this space. As Chase mentioned, you know, the original model is is 10% larger, um, and so we could scale it down so it would fit comfortably in here, and we could actually fabricate it. Okay. In terms of the sculptures of the world, <laughs> 13 tons is a big sculpture. Well, actually, no. no. I've got this one. <laughs> as long as you don't call a building a sculpture, which you well, would, but. I mean, there's, I mean, you know, Richard Serra, who uses the same kind of material, and actually, many of his works are the same frustum shapes, um, and oh. they're bent and shaped in shipyards. Um, you know, single elements of his sculpture can weigh 40 tons. You know, um, it's the total weight of the sculptures can be up to close to like 70, 80, 100 tons of steel. Um, but they're very rigid, right? I mean, they have a very different feeling. Um, 
I like steel because of its dynamic properties, um, and that's what I'm, I've been most interested in is that kind of behavior over time. So the largest moving sculpture. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. If you're scaling this up, I mean, how much is your sort of investment in, um, you know, like craft and being involved in terms of, you know, improvising? I mean, is that a limiting factor in terms of how large something? I mean, would there be a point where you would be as involved in fabrication, and would that make a difference to you? Um, I think it, yeah, I think it would make a difference, and this is about my, the maximum, right? This, I don't think, I can't work with steel much heavier than this, much thicker or much weightier. Um, so, yeah, there would be something very different, right? But I think, uh, uh, yeah, and I would miss that, right? I mean, I enjoy, I like making things, and I particularly like figuring out how things are going to work, mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of becoming kind of, uh, sort of intimate with the behavior of the material. Um, you know, it's very, I mean, just assembling this, you know, I've assembled so many of these sculptures over the year that, years that, you know, when we we're putting things together, I'd watch my helpers would be struggling and I could just push it, you know, I knew that, you know, if I pushed it just this way or put it, you know, and it's, and it's only something you acquire, right, from, from familiarity. Um, so that would be, yeah, it would be different. Um, but I would still like to be, if that were the case, I would still like to be working with the fabricators you know, I would like to be there, right? I'd like to see the machines that could, you know, make this out of heavier material at a larger scale. I think that would be, you know, I'd love that, right? I'd love to be in the shop. I, I'm not the kind of person who would just like to send it off and then turn up when it was finished, right? Well, we're going to have a little break for some from coffee. There's some still coffee and refreshments out there. So um, thank you all. And we'll, uh, we'll reconvene in about uh, 20 minutes. Well, it's great to see your presentation, you know, just yeah. you know, everything that's kind of underneath. Yeah, yeah, no.